Okay, last Sunday we started into the book of Ruth. Uh, I figured that until the end, until the first of the year, we'll be looking at passages in Ruth. Ruth is kind of a short book, but um, it's got some good lessons for us. In Ruth chapter 1, we looked at the uh, destitution of Naomi. Uh, the story begins with Elimelech and his two sons, Mahlon and Kilion and uh, Elimelech's wife, Naomi, and how they, because of a famine, have to leave their home in Bethlehem, the house of bread, to go and sojourn in the field of Moab. And then the text proceeds to tell us how almost every single male figure in this story dies, leaving Naomi quite destitute, and the widows of Mahlon and Kilion, whom they married in the land of Moab, Ruth and Orpah, are also destitute widows at this time. And so, Naomi decides upon hearing that the Lord has visited his people and that he has given bread to Bethlehem and that he has ended the famine, she decides, okay, I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. And Ruth and Orpah want to follow along, but Naomi spends quite a... The bulk of chapter 1 is basically spent talking about, with Naomi talking them out of it or attempting to talk them out of it. Naomi stacks up the incredible impossibility that they will be able to remarry in her family and that they will be able to produce children in her family. If Even if she were to have a husband, being an old woman, that very night, and even if she, being an old woman, were able to conceive that very night, it's still absolutely implausible that Ruth and Orpah would wait the required number of years for these children she would birth to grow up and become their husbands. The situation is completely hopeless. The Lord, she says in verse uh, 13, the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Naomi sees God as the source of her suffering. We noted last time that you know, even though Naomi sees God as the source of her suffering, this is not a reason for her to walk away from God, and she doesn't do that. You know, she doesn't deny God's existence. She doesn't try to blame the religious establishments of her day. Rather, she continues to express trust in the Lord. You know, she has absolute trust in the fact that God is in charge of the situation, whether for good or for ill. And she has accepted her adversity. You know, some people, they accept good from God, but not adversity. But Naomi is prepared to deal with both. And, but in spite of all these protests, Ruth is determined. Orpah leaves them and says, okay, she'll go back to Moab. Orpah does the expected thing. Ruth does the extraordinary thing, saying that you do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse if anything but death parts you and me. Ruth is determined. And Naomi comes back to Bethlehem. And the situation looks pretty bleak. Because everybody greets Naomi and they say, Oh, it's Naomi. They're so happy to see her. But Naomi whose name means pleasant, says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. Because the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with, I went out full, but the Lord has returned me empty. So why do you call me pleasant since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? But the chapter ends on this note, this comment, this passing remark, that they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. And then we come to chapter 2, which is where we are this morning. Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. It's kind of an introductory note to the chapter here. Yes? Okay. Yes. No. Lord ever rebuked. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's hard to see into the minds of the characters. In chapter 1 and verse 21, for instance, uh, Naomi makes this comment that the Lord has witnessed against me. And some people have taken that to mean that. You know, she thought the Lord was punishing her for some slight or some sin. And it was common in the ancient world to believe that 
A lot of people in the ancient world believed that if you suffered, it was because you did something bad to deserve it. You must have done something to deserve your suffering. Um, this is the whole wrong assumption of Job's friends in the book of Job. And it might be, Na I don't know if that's Naomi's assumption in verse 21. That's pretty ambiguous wording. Um, you know, we have that problem even today, though. People have this tendency to assume that just because, they, well, because they're suffering, it must have or rather, we have the tendency to assume that about others. You're suffering, so you must have done something bad. Even in, you know, even in the U.S. of A., I've seen people talk that way about others. You know, you know, we're not, we haven't escaped from that mentality among Christians in the 21st century. We need to be careful about that. Sometimes people just suffer for completely different reasons. You know, it wasn't that this man sinned or that his parents sinned, that he was born blind, as Jesus says in John chapter 9. But rather, it was uh, so that the works of God may be demonstrated through him, so the glory of God may be demonstrated. And it may be the case with Naomi. We're not told why she suffers. But by the end of the story, the Lord's glory is clearly demonstrated. And it's clear that he has a grander purpose in mind. And we start to see that here in chapter 2. Uh, Naomi has a kinsman, or uh, some uh, another way you could translate that is a friend. Well, we know he's a kinsman because he's of the family of Elimelech in verse 1. He's a man of great wealth. Uh, you know, Boaz, uh, literally, he's a mighty man of valor. That term is sometimes used of military men, but uh, here it probably just refers to the fact that he was wealthy and had social standing. Uh, he is of the clan of Elimelech, which implies something that in verse 21, Naomi was wrong. And that even though she says that she is empty, well, there's somebody in her family that can still act as redeemer. But we're going to unfold that as the story uh, continues. This prepares the reader for what's going to happen next, which is this guy named Boaz, whom the narrator mentions in verse 1, is going to have a chance encounter with Ruth the Moabitess. And I'm going to use the word chance, but just assume that it is in quotes the whole time, because, well, as we will see, it's probably not really chance. Uh, can I get a volunteer to read verses 2 through 7, where Ruth goes to glean in the field? Verses 2 through 7 of chapter 2. Ruth Moabite said to them, Go to the field. And I did my favor. Said to her, Oh, my daughter, this heart is in the field. Oh, go ask him. Bethlehem said to the reaper, May the Lord be with you. He said to him, Then go ask him. Okay, so here Ruth asks permission from her mother-in-law to go out and glean in the field. Uh, now, first of all, what, what's this thing, what's this practice of gleaning in the field? We're not really, most of us out here aren't really farmers, I think, so what, what are they doing? Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, they would pick up what the reapers missed. Um, Correct. Yes. Yes. Several places. Leviticus chapter 19 in verses 9 and 10 says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger I am the Lord. Another passage is in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy 24 in verses 19 through 22. When you reap your harvest in your field and have forgotten a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow, in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive tree, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not go over it again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, for the widow. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this thing. As was stated, it's basically, you don't 
you, you go over your field, you harvest stuff, and then you don't go back to get what you missed. You leave that for people. Um, and you leave that for the poor, for the widow, for the orphan, for the needy, for the stranger. Those people should be allowed to come along afterwards and pick up your leftovers. Because if you didn't need it the first time, you don't really need it this time. They need it more than you do. That provision is several times in the Law of Moses. And it's what's going on here in Ruth chapter 2. Although we're going to see that um, Boaz actually goes a little bit further than that even. Um, and we need to appreciate something else too. Um, which is that this chapter, more than any other chap... Did you have something, Jen? This chapter, more than any other chapter in the book of Ruth, emphasizes the fact that she was a Moabitess. She's from the Moabites. Why do you think that is? Coincidence? <laughs> Well, nothing that happens in this chapter is coincidence, either, even though it's played that way. Uh, why, why, bring up, why bring that up so much in this chapter in particular, though? What's, what, what is the narrator trying to draw our attention to? Yeah. Okay, we're on the right track. Okay. Well, they, they, hired Bala they hired Balaam to curse them, <laughs> which the Lord wasn't real happy with them with, uh, about. Um, I think we need to appreciate something, because we, we live in 21st century United States of America, you know, and people who are widows in today's culture can, you know, go up to the Publix whenever they need food and not worry about people assaulting them or attacking them in some way. But is it that way in the ancient world? Not exactly. You know, and, you know, here we're, we're in a situation where I'm going to go out in the field by myself and go glean among the reapers, and hopefully someone will let me take their food out of the field. Because, yeah, I know, the law of Moses says you're supposed to leave your gleanings for the poor, the needy, the orphan, and the stranger, and all that. How good at keeping that law do you think Israel was? How good at keeping any of their laws is Israel? They weren't very good at it at all, right? And this is the time of the judges, where they're especially not good at stuff like that. You know, we, we appreciate something about this, that just because the law of Moses says to do something, that doesn't mean Israel was ever doing it. It may have meant that Israel was really... This is, the law of Moses is usually a list of stuff that Israel didn't do right. They were supposed to be doing it, but they didn't. You know, You've got to distinguish between what the law says and what they actually practiced. And in this case... Mo Ruth is acting with great risk. She is a Moabite widow. You know, she's extremely vulnerable class of society. She's a foreigner on top of that, which means that whatever, you know, there, there's some kind of racial tension that is possible here as well. You know, and to subvert the risk inherent in her status as a Moabite widow, Ruth says that she needs to go find favor in someone's eyes. I need to go see the one in whose sight I may find favor. Verse 2. Right, and we're, we're going we're gonna to get to that in a minute. Yeah, no, that's another point to bring out, certainly. Um, although we're, we're going to talk about exactly what she's doing in this field. Uh, the, now, at this point in the story, Ruth and Naomi are just hoping to be able to eat. Uh, yeah, if she can get one person to like her, she'll be able to glean crops and put food on the table. And, it, well, of course, God has bigger plans than this. She's hoping to find favor in someone's eyes so that she can eat. But ultimately, it will end, the story will end with her finding rest in the house of her husband, as Naomi prayed in chapter 1 in verse 9. Her great risk is answered in this story by Boaz's protection. You know, and Ruth's already taking a great risk just by even being in Israel at all. She's left her family. She's left all that's familiar. She's left her people. She's left everything that she considered part of her life before to come participate in a nation and a strange people that are not at all what she's familiar with. That's one great risk she's taken. Now she's going to go out and glean in the fields in public and taking another great risk. But 
even though Ruth's taking great risks, Yahweh is going to respond with great rewards. So Ruth goes and she gleans in the field after the reapers. Now the first part of verse 3 um, is probably that line there, she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. That line is probably just a summary of what follows. And I'll explain why in a minute. Because what happens apparently is Ruth first has to go ask, first goes and asks permission to glean in the field. Um, and, and gleaning is not a wealthy way of living. It's, you know, you go and you follow the guys being paid to harvest and you pick anything they drop by mistake. Which, you know, it's like a homeless person trying to fund their lifestyle by selling aluminum cans. It's, you know, it, it's not it's not a wealthy way of living. Um, but it's what, it's what they have available to them. And, according to verse 3, she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, which was of the family of Elimelech. She just happened to come there. The verb implies that you know, this whole thing happened by chance. I just happened to coincidentally stumble into the field of the guy who the narrator mentioned in verse 1. Well, is this something that happened by chance? Now, the narrator's implication, anytime the narrator says something happened by chance, anytime the Bible says something happened by chance, there, there, there should be like a little uh, winky-faced emoticon next to it, you know, kind of saying, you know, yeah, it was by chance. Because the reality is that there are no accidents in the world of Scripture. It's already been established in chapter 1, Naomi doesn't believe the stuff that happened to her was an accident. She believes that the Lord's hand was against her, and that's why she was suffering. So, when Ruth just happens to find Boaz's field, is that an accident? Not if we're being consistent in how we read the story. Well, the Lord's also involved in this incident as well. Naomi's calamity was not an accident. Ruth finding Boaz's field is not an accident. In the book of Ruth, there are no accidents. And, verse 4, Behold... You know, more kind of surprise type language. Behold, Boaz just happens to show up at the same time. Is that an accident? This is, you know, more chance encounters. Well, I mean, you know, well, it's his field. He shows up to check on his workers at the same time that Ruth just happens to wander into his field. But you think about it, it's not like they could just check in on Facebook or something and, uh, you know, know where each other were. Like, um like we can do today. No, what, what, what's going on here is this is more coincidence that's not really coincidence. And Boaz and his workers, they greet each other. May Yahweh be with you. May Yahweh bless you. You know, these are just customary greetings. There's probably, they probably may not have even thought much of the fact that they said them. But it means more than they realize. Because Yahweh really is with them, which is why all of the events in the story are going to unfold in the way that they do. Uh, Boaz consults with his servant. He asks the question, Whose young woman is this? In verse 5. Uh, what, what is meant by that question? No. Who is she? No. Whose family is she from? Whose servant is she? Uh, if she's a slave, who does she belong to? Uh, is this a vague attempt to learn her circumstances? Some people think it's a vague inquiry about her marriageability, uh, which may not really have crossed Boaz's mind at this point. Uh, some combination of these things. Well, the servant explains. She is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. She is Ruth the Moabitess. Uh, but Ruth isn't just known for being a Moabitess. What else is she known for? What is her reputation? She loves Naomi. How much does she love Naomi? She came back with her. You know, which, I mean, let's not lose the significance of that. Let's not forget the impact of that idea. Ruth left her home country at great personal sacrifice to come back to Israel and be with Naomi. So, this event that she's done, this great momentous sacrifice that she's made, it wasn't all for naught. Because the fact that she has done this influences what will happen next. And this servant says, oh yes, we know her. She's the one that came back with Naomi. Boaz knows what that means and he's going to, and it's going to influence his actions as we see in this chapter. 
Uh, and in addition to being a Moabitess, Ruth is known for her association with Naomi. This works to her advantage. The uh, Verse 7, uh, there's some translation issues with verse 7, and to the point where most Bible versions don't really even agree. Um, the bulk of Bible translations will say that you know, basically, something to the gist of, she's been in the field all morning, and she barely even stopped to rest, or she hasn't stopped to rest, or she's just now stopped to rest. And, but she's been hard at work all morning, Boaz. Um, and, but there's another one, there's another possibility, which is probably more likely in light of uh, the fact what happens next, and it is the fact that uh, Ruth has shown up and asked for permission to glean among the reapers, and she's basically been waiting all morning. And then the gist of the last bit, which says uh, the house has been little to her. In other words, she's practically taken up residence here because she's waiting for an answer as to whether or not she can glean in your field. Uh, and that's a possibility as well, which makes more sense in light of the fact that Boaz has to show up and give her permission to glean in the field in verses 8 and following. Um, but admittedly, the Hebrew on verse 7 is extremely difficult. Um, and... You know, what, what we have, it also explains the, the statement here. She's let me glean and gather among the, she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. And then she came and has stood from the morning until now. Which stood implies here, she's kind of stood here waiting for an answer as well. Um, now, what we're going on, of course, why does Ruth ask permission to glean? Didn't we just establish that gleaning was a thing that was in the law? Might not be the law of Moab. That's true. That's possible. Yeah, the law isn't very well... Right, we've already mentioned that the law wasn't very well kept by the Israelites, which explains the need to ask permission. It could just be simple caution. You know, it's hard to imagine a world where Ruth isn't at least familiar with Israelite customs to some extent, because she's been married to one for ten years. Uh, let's not forget that part of the story that was in chapter one. But at the same time, better safe than sorry. So she asks permission to glean in the field. The fact that Ruth is a Moabite widow means she really must be careful about who she takes grain from. Don't do it without asking first, lest she bring potential trouble on herself. All right. Well, in a minute, we're going to look at the results of this chance meeting. I'll just stop here and ask, are there anybody, any comments or questions or observations? I think there was a comment that was going to be made, and then, for whatever reason, we passed it up. Was it you, Jen, or... <laughs> Today's equivalent would not gleaning your fields. That's a good question. Granted, most of us here aren't really farmers, and so you know we don't make our living off of uh, produce and leftover food and things like that. Um, there's a point to be made uh, in terms. I think I think there's a general principle to be stated. You know that being penny smart isn't seen as a biblical virtue, if if that makes sense. In other words, it's not like I have to keep track of every little resource I have because if even the slightest thing gets away from me, I'm not being a good steward of it. Well, the truth is that that's not the way the Bible portrays it exactly. The Bible says, no, that's for the needy and for the stranger. You know, is now what applications can you make of that? Um, well, I mean, there's any number of things, I'm sure. Uh, we have to really think about it and reflect on it for our own, own selves, first and foremost. Uh, but I would say that th this mentality that we have that, you know, every penny of my money is mine and doesn't belong to anybody else whatsoever. It's the wrong perspective to have, because according to the Bible, everything that you have is already a gift from God anyway. You know, when we talk about being a good steward of your money, being a good steward of your money is not being stingy. The Bible never equates being a good steward with stinginess. You will not find a single verse in the scripture that says it that way. The Bible has frequent exhortations towards generosity. 
and being giving towards others. But never once is uh, being a good steward used as an excuse not to be given. Uh, that's something that people need to, I think, take note of as we try to apply things. Perhaps maybe not be such great lovers of money. Because if we love it too much, we cannot love both God and wealth. Uh, now, let's look at Boaz, who clearly, uh, as we're going to see in verses 8 through 16, doesn't love money enough to keep himself from being generous, and doesn't love his crops enough to keep from being generous. Somebody read verses 8 through 16, Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2, verses 8 through 16. Get a reader. So, like, um, one thing that I note in passing is Boaz refers to Ruth as my daughter in verse 8. Uh, and Naomi does this too throughout the book. But there's several places in the book where Boaz refers to Ruth as, quote, my daughter. What do you, what do you figure that, why does he say that? Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's, I mean, you know, that's certainly a good point to bring out. It is a term of endearment, certainly. Um, but why my daughter as opposed to, say, my sister? She is substantially younger than he is, right. Uh, and suggests Boaz is substantially older than Ruth. Maybe even old enough to be her father. Who knows? Which kind of sounds a little weird to us because they get married by the end of the story. Um... You know, ancient ideas about marriage are a little different than ours. Um, Boaz later considers, and in fact, this comes up in verse 10 of chapter 3, where he says, May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Uh, which Boaz says, you know, you could have gone after someone your own, old age, but in your own age, but instead you come after someone like me. Uh, now, you know, in today's society, the idea of a man marrying a woman younger than himself like that is considered really taboo and you know, like a big no-no. But that's not the way ancient people thought about marriage. And, and marriage had more of a, I guess, a, a function, if you will. This is not a marriage over romance. It is a marriage for a deeper purpose of redeeming the family. Yes. Right. You see, that's the thing. Our society would look down on people doing what Ruth does. But the Bible says that she's a woman of virtue. She's a woman of valor. You know, the Bible praises her for what she does here. I don't. You 
You don't agree? I'm the Biden. Oh, brother. 17 years old. Ready? saying it doesn't happen. Married a man, actually rather wealthy, but his son, executor of his estate, administrator of his estate, all the way before he died, married him just to take care of him. Had nothing in return. Yeah, I'm, he was quite a bit older. <laughs> okay. Hey, that happened. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. I'm saying that there's a social taboo about it, and people tend to criticize that. Okay. There's a difference. No, no I'm, I'm, I'm saying you know, our society does tend to conflate the two together. You know, I'm not saying I disagree with what you're saying. I'm saying that our society tends to view things as taboo even when the Bible does not. We need to be careful about that. Um, anyhow, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> um, the, uh, the servants have been instructed, verse 9, not to touch her. Uh, not only is she given access to, to Boaz's maids, he's also given access uh, to the water jars, which normally water drawing in the Bible, it's either the women or the foreigners that do the water drawing. But here this foreign woman gets access to water that's already been drawn for Boaz's servants in verse 9. Um, in verse 10, um, after Boaz has presented her with this generosity, she bows to the ground and asks, Why have I found favor in your sight? You'll notice there's kind of a play on what happened in verse 3. She said, I want to go and see in whose sight I find favor. Here in verse 10, she's found favor in Boaz's sight. She wants to know why. The favor she's found exceeds expectations. He's given her not only the right to glean in his field, but protection among his servants and access to his drinking water. Uh, Boaz's generosity thwarts the normal social customs by having his Israelite men draw water for a foreign woman. Ruth wants to know why Boaz has taken notice of her. And why has he taken notice of her? What's the response? Yes, because he had heard what she had done for Naomi. The simple reason is Boaz is aware of everything that Ruth is doing for Naomi. He sees the implications of Ruth's determination in chapter 1 to leave Naomi. He sees those implications quite clearly. She has left everything for a situation that does not profit her in order to selflessly help another person. Kind of like in some of these you know, marriage type situations Mark's describing. People are helping others in their old age. Though a foreigner, she will be treated as family since she left family for foreigners. She left the land of her birth to come to a people she did not previously know. Kind of like Abraham and Sarah. How can Boaz, an Israelite, mistreat people who are imitating his own patriarchal ancestors whom he looks up to so much? Abraham. Boaz doesn't let something like petty, like race or nationality or custom get in the way. He recognizes that character transcends culture. And Boaz concludes his statement with a prayer for future blessing in verse 12. He prays that Yahweh will reward her work and give her her full wages. And while Naomi has declared herself to be empty in chapter 1 and verse 21, Boaz asks for the Lord to make Ruth full. And by extension, to make Naomi full as well. Now, Boaz himself, of course, is going to be instrumental in actually answering that prayer. See, the chapter unfolds. And another important... Um, and Ruth responds with uh, this statement of humility. I found favor in your sight. She calls Boaz Adonai, which means Lord. Um, Boaz has comforted her. He's spoken kindly to her. And, you know, the idea of comfort is all the more important when we realize how much comfort is really needed in this situation. Uh, how much Ruth has to fear here. 
The common sense would have told Ruth, no, don't go to Israel. That's not a good idea. Her friends and her family might have urged her, don't go. You're going to be in danger. You have no long-term plan for economic viability. You have nothing to gain from this. But God offers true comfort for his servants. True comfort for those who are genuinely willing to do his will, to do the right thing. To go above and beyond the call of duty, as Ruth has done. Ruth sees herself not even equal to Boaz's slave women. And yet, well, she has in fact exceeded in virtue so many for her willingness to sacrifice self. At mealtime, uh, Boaz invites Ruth to eat with the crew, dipping her bread in the, uh, the vinegar or the sour wine, however you translate that. Um... Ruth eats roasted grain, is satisfied, and has leftovers. And, you know, again, our culture kind of tries to shield us from seeing what a big deal this is. This isn't like when you go to Olive Garden and you have, you know, they give you way more pasta than you can eat and you have to get a to-go box. For the ancient people, especially for someone in Ruth's situation, eating a meal that's so filling that you have some left over is a big deal. You know... Because she and Naomi are worried, where is their fruit? where's our food going to come from? How are we going to eat? Here she's able to eat to the full, have some left over, take it home. Yeah, yeah. I remember. One example. There was a cat, a great cat, on the down into the dishwater, wash the dishes out, find mm -hmm. pieces of food, find them on the dishwater, that was carving a great cat. Some were pretty fat. Over in India, they don't. No, they don't. No, a, That's the way it was back here. Moses promised us Yes, uh, Leviticus chapter 26 in verses 9 and 10. I will turn toward you and make you fruitful and multiply you. I will confirm my covenant with you. You will eat the old supply and clear out the old because of the new. Uh, that's a good point to bring up. Um, the... Alright, so this is a big deal. Being allowed to eat to the full and have some left over. And Boaz also instructs servants, in verse 16, he actually tells his servants, I want you to drop some stuff for her to pick up. Drop it on purpose. Most of the time, gleaning was, you know, the stuff the reapers dropped by accident. But Boaz actually gives his servants instructions to drop the gleanings on purpose so that Ruth can pick them up. He goes beyond the law's normal requirements that we read about in the beginning. You know, in, there's a Jewish work called the Mishnah. Uh, it was originally an oral tradition that circulated for a long time before it was put down in writing in the 2nd century AD. But one of, there's a huge series of debates in the Mishnah about when you drop a sheaf in the field, how big it could be before you could go back for it. You know, I mean, and there's, so there's a huge argument about where you drop it, or how much you drop, or, you know, the circumstances, or in what way you dropped it. And it's a huge argument about, you know, okay, can I go back for that sheaf and not leave it? Or can, do I have to leave it? And that's what the Mishnah sees. It sees the sheaf law as something you have to do. And so therefore, we're going to treat it like we treat our taxes and do the absolute bare minimum that we have to do. But that's not how Boaz views the sheaf law. Boaz sees, goes above and beyond the law's normal requirements and actually tells his servants, drop extra food for this woman so that she can be provided for. And furthermore, there's a double warning of protection. Verse 15, do not insult her. Verse 16, do not rebuke her. Another comment, in verse 15, I skipped over this, sorry. He says, let her glean among the sheaves, which is, in other words, you know, let her actually go between the piles of wheat and pick up things that have fallen on the ground there, which, you know, that's the best place to glean, but it's also the most prone to abuse. You know, you could, someone could steal from your actual piles of harvested wheat. But Boaz says, no, let her do that. Don't stop her. Boaz's behavior is incredibly generous to sum up. 
He gives Ruth access to the maids, the water, the meals. He gives a poor gleaner the right to eat with his reapers. She eats to the full and has some left over. She's served by her host. She is given the best access to the gleanings. She's deliberately left gleanings that do not have to be left. Boaz's generosity, what does it remind us of? It reminds us of Jesus. There you go, right. Um, and there's a certain... Somebody has figured out the secret code to answering all the Bible class questions. Uh, which is that if you don't know the answer, the answer is always Jesus. There is some similarity, certainly. Um, now, of course, you know we can also think back earlier in the book to God's provision for Israel. As God provided Bethlehem with bread, so God provides Ruth with bread through this Bethlehemite. Uh, the Lord's reward that Boaz prayed she would have is given through Boaz. You know, and how many times have we seen people struggling with a situation and, you know, they're talking about what they need to do. You know, it's like Ruth comes and says, I, I really, I got to glean in the field so we can have enough to eat. I hope that works out for you, Ruth. I really do. Now, Boaz says that. How many times have we said that to people? I hope that works out for you. Ah, that's the, that's the key to this whole thing. Boaz says it, but then he goes about making it happen, too. I hope that works out for, here, for you. Here, let's make sure it works out for you. Boaz actually m makes it happen. Nothing wrong with saying it, but back it up with your actions. Um, Boaz, for Boaz, well wishes weren't enough. As a servant of God, he would be a participant in seeing God's favor come to fruition. The fact that Boaz serves Ruth at the feast foreshadows Jesus too, I think. And in this way. Because... Here we are, we are very much like Ruth, destitute, outsiders, we don't have a right to eat at the table of the Lord, and yet the Lord says, come and eat at my table. And he is the one who provides us with food at that table. Though we were outcasts and foreigners, we eat at the table of our Lord Christ, and eat the abundant food of our gracious Lord Christ. Now, and, you know, I mean, you could even try to make you know, a point about the bread and the sour wine, but I'm not going to go that far. For now, at least. Um, but there is something to that. That Boaz is a kind of a type of Christ. And Ruth is a type of his people who is to be wed to him. Um, you know, that's something to think about. The fact that Boaz serves Ruth as the host of her own feast. It foreshadows one who serves us as hosted as his own feast. Alright, so we have verse 8, Boaz's generosity in verses 8 through 16. Now, very, very quickly, we're almost out of time. Verses 17 through 23. She gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. She took it up and went into the city. And uh, her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She took it out and gave Naomi what she had left after she was satisfied. Her mother-in-law then said to her, Where did you glean today? Where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, This man is our relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Ruth the Moabitess said, Furthermore, he said to me, you should, you should stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maids so that others do not fall upon you in the, another field. So she stayed close by the maids of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. So Ruth gleans until evening, beats out about an ephah of barley, which, uh, for the in the interest of time, I'm not going to take you through the math to reach this conclusion, but the amount of food that Ruth pulls out is about a half a month's worth of food in one day. Uh, in using lower estimates. It could be more than that. But at least half a month's worth of food in one day. Um, so, she's been pretty profitable. The Lord had, But more than that, it's the Lord that has provided her for it with this through Boaz. But it isn't all that God has to offer. It's a down payment. The Lord, can, the Lord is not done bringing Ruth's uh, fertility to fruition. The fertility of Boaz's field to Ruth foreshadows how Boaz will become a source of fertility to Ruth's house later. Uh, she gets this big Epa of barley along with her to-go box from lunch that she brings home to Naomi, which, when you think about how time-consuming it was to cook food back then, the fact that she has a cooked meal for Naomi when she gets home is also kind of a big deal. But 
the big reveal for Naomi is that she worked in the field of Boaz. And while Ruth didn't know who Boaz was, Naomi knew exactly who he was because he was a kinsman, he was a friend of the family. In verse 1, we learned that information already. Naomi knows what the narrator told, has already told us. And so when she hears that Boaz was the helper, well, Naomi isn't bitter anymore. She's overjoyed because she knows what this man is. He is a kinsman redeemer. And in the interest of time, we'll talk more about what kinsmen redeemer do next time. But one of the things they do is this um, leveret marriage. So the solution, of course, is that Ruth is to cling to the maids of Boaz until the bar end of the barley harvest. So whereas chapter 1 ended with the beginning of the barley harvest, chapter 2 ends with the end of the barley harvest. And then, well, we'll see what happens next on Thursday when we get into chapter 3. Any comments or questions before we close? There's a lot more in those verses I didn't get to in the interest of time, but I thank you all for your attention this morning and uh, hope that we are enjoying this study. Hmm.